Good day everyone. In this video, we will be presenting the power generation industry, particularly the energy production of fossil fuel and hydrogen fuel. But before we formally begin, I would like to emphasize the importance of energy. As technology becomes widely used, we gradually start to be dependent on these innovations in our everyday lives. From transportation to food production, it is hard to imagine how the world will move and how people would live without energy. Thus, it is important for us to study about energy and how the power generation works. The content of our report includes introduction, process description and chemical processes, material and energy balance, and the industry in the Philippine setting. Fossil fuels are natural sources of energy that comes from the remains of dead animals and plants millions of years ago. They contain high percentage of carbon, which is responsible for trapping the solar energy from the sun. They are also highly combustible that typically produces carbon dioxide, water, and heat, which is the energy. They are classified as non-renewable energy sources simply because fossil fuels take millions of years to form, while the depletion of reserves and deposits is much faster than its formation. The main types of fossil fuels are coal, oil, and natural gas. Coal is a solid fossil fuel mainly found in underground deposits. Based from its approximate chemical formula, carbon is the most abundant element from its chemical constituents. The extraction method includes underground mining and surface mining. Some examples of coal are lignite, bituminous, and anthracite. Lignite is located nearest on the Earth's surface. It contains 25-35% to 35 of carbon and has a calorific value of 9 to 19 kilojoule per gram. Bituminous is found deeper underground. It contains 45 to 85 percent carbon and has a calorific value of 26 to 35 kilojoule per gram. Last is anthracite, which is found deepest underground. It contains 85 to 98 percent carbon and has a calorific value of 30 to 35 kilojoule per gram. Based from these examples, we can observe that the higher the carbon content of a coal, the higher the calorific value. The formation of coal can be traced back 300 million years ago or during the Carboniferous period. During this time, earth is covered with swamps wherein ancient plants like giant ferns thrived and withered. 200 million years after, water, dirt, and other particles started to cover the plants and bury underground. 100 million years after, the dead plants gradually hardened due to heat and pressure from the earth's crust. The energy stored in coal was the energy absorbed by the plants in form of carbon. The next type of fossil fuel is oil. It is a liquid fossil fuel formed from the remains of sea plants and animals. It is usually found in underground reservoirs, crevices, and pores of sedimentary rock. Similar with coal, carbon is the most abundant element in the chemical composition of crude oil. The formation of oil coincided with the formation of coal. 300 to 400 million years ago, sea plants and animals, particularly algae, lived and died in the oceans. Through the years, layers of sun and silt slowly covered the remains. Gradually, the heat and pressure from the Earth's crust turned the remains to oil and gas deposits. The last type is natural gas. It is a gaseous fossil fuel formed from the remains of marine microorganisms. It is relatively new and cleaner than oil and coal. The reason why it is cleaner than oil and coal is simply because natural gas is primarily made up of methane. Methane or CH4 consists of more hydrogen than carbon. This means that when it is combusted, it would form more H2O than CO2. There are two types of natural gas. First is conventional and the second one is unconventional. Conventional natural gas can be found in porous and permeable rock beds. It is usually mixed with oil reservoirs. Conventional natural gas is easy and less expensive to extract, which can be done by standard drilling. On the other hand, unconventional natural gas requires stimulation techniques such as fracking, since the natural gas is trapped in reservoir with poor permeability and porosity which makes it difficult to extract. In the chemical composition of natural gas, methane makes up the most of it with 98.46%.
the C6 plus indicates the other hydrocarbon with 6 and more carbons. The formation of natural gas is quite similar with oil but with more heat and pressure applied, which further decomposes the remains to natural gas. Now, let's see the history and emergence of the power generation industry. Here is a brief history of coal. During 100-200 AD, archaeologists found proof that Romans in England used coal. In 14th century, Hopi Indians in North America used coal for heating and making pottery from clay. In 1673, the existence of coal was rediscovered in North America. In 18th century, it was discovered that coal produces a fuel that burned hotter than wood charcoal. In 1770s, James Watt innovated and improved the steam engine. It utilizes the steam from coal to power up the engine. Because of this, the machines were able to perform work which was previously done by humans. With the innovation of the steam engine, the 19th century saw the first industrial revolution. In addition to the transition to new manufacturing processes, the use of steamships and steam-powered railroads became the mainstream for transportation. It used coal to fuel the boilers and transported goods which resulted to higher profits. In 1875, Weapon factories began to use coal. The coke, which is made from coal, replaced charcoal as the fuel in blast furnaces in making steel. Then in 1880, coal was first used to generate electricity. Let's move to natural gas. Ancient record states that natural gas seeped from the ground on Mount Parnassus in ancient Greece during the 1000 BC. In 500 BC, the Chinese used crude bomb pipelines to transport gas seeping on the ground. They used it to boil seawater to get drinking water. In 1626, the French explorers in America discovered igniting gases seeping around Lake Erie. In 1785, the British used natural gas to light streets and houses. In 1816, Baltimore, Maryland used the manufactured gas from Britain for street lights. They are the first city in the United States to do it. In 1821, William Hart discovered the first usable natural gas well in Fredonia, New York. Fredonia Gaslight Company was formed and became the first American natural gas distributor. In 1836, the state of Philadelphia created the first natural gas distribution company. And in 1885, Robert Bunsen invented the Bunsen burner. In 20th century, the expansion and innovation on the use of natural gas was progressive in terms of the invention of new appliances such as water heaters and oven. It also covered some manufacturing plants and generation of electricity. Now, let's move to the current and future demand of commodities produced in the industry. Based from the graph, there would be a continuous rise of petroleum and natural gas and a downward trend for coal. One reason is that petroleum generates 40 to 60 percent more energy per gram than coal. Second is natural gas emits 50 to 60 percent less carbon dioxide than coal. Third factor is the surge of renewable energy sources. However, most of these are still more expensive than the fossil fuels. Second, it is intermittent, which means that some of the renewable energy sources are dependent on the geographical locations such as wind and sunlight. Now, let's review the coal consumption last 2017. More than 50% came from China. This is primarily because of their infrastructure construction, which leads to production of energy-intensive building materials such as steel and cement. However, demand for coal is expected to remain flat or fall simply because of the Clean Air Act and efforts of countries to reduce pollution in addressing environmental concerns. Looking at oil consumption, countries with large land mass such as the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia have considerable oil consumption. Because of their sovereignty, they have wide coverage of deposits to extract oil. The other countries listed are the ones with high gross domestic product annually. They are very active in World Trade Organization in which they try to optimize their overall economic activity, thus requiring large inputs of energy in their industrial sector. The same reasons can be implied in the natural gas consumption. 
Based from the infographic, coal is still the most used fossil fuel in the country. Even with the detrimental environmental effect, Philippines continues to rely on coal and is currently building more coal-based power plants. One reason for this is the pro-coal government policies that allow energy companies to build coal facilities despite the negative impacts. Here are some concerns with the use of fossil fuels. First is the rise of carbon dioxide emission. The effects are ocean acidification, which could kill marine life, and elevation of global temperature since carbon dioxide traps heat from the sun. Next one is acid rain. Traces of nitrogen and sulfur from the fossil fuel bond with oxygen during combustion. This forms nitrous and sulfuric oxides that causes acid rain. Last one is the limitation, considering that fossil fuels take millions of years to form. Now, let's move to hydrogen fuel. With all the energy sources and their corresponding concerns, hydrogen fuel might be the solution for this. Hydrogen fuel is a zero-emission fuel, which means that it does not emit harmful byproducts in the environment. It is commonly used in fuel cells. The first fuel cell was made by William Robert Grove in 1839. Ludwig Mond and Charles Langer first coined the term fuel cell. Based from the combustion of hydrogen gas, it produces energy without harmful gases such as carbon dioxide. Some countries that have hydrogen fuel cell are France, Germany, and Norway. France has 260 hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and 20 hydrogen fueling stations. Germany is currently developing fuel cell automotives for trains, while Norway is studying the use of fuel cell in ferries. Here are some methods of producing hydrogen. First one is thermal processes. It is a high temperature process which typically involves the use of steam reforming. 95% of today's hydrogen production depend on this process. Some examples are natural gas reforming, coal gasification, biomass gasification, and renewable liquid fuel reforming. Natural gas reforming uses high temperature steam of 700 to 1000 Celsius and a pressure of 3 to 25 bar. The primary objective of steam reforming is to convert methane to hydrogen gas. The carbon monoxide byproduct can be processed through water gas ship reaction to produce additional hydrogen gas. Coal gasification is the reaction of coal with oxygen and steam under high pressure and temperature to produce synthesis gas, which is the carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The approximate coal gasification produces the hydrogen gas. The CO byproduct can also be treated using water gas shift reaction. Biomass gasification is the conversion of organic or fossil-based material at high temperature but without combustion. One example is glucose which is gasified into several products. Water gas shift reaction can also be used to treat the carbon monoxide. Adsorbers are optional to separate the hydrogen. Last one under thermal processes is renewable liquid fuel reforming. In this process, biomass resources are first converted to ethanol, bio oil, or liquid biofuel. The liquid biofuel is then reacted with high temperature steam and catalyst to produce reformate gas. Here is an example of ethanol steam reforming to produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide can later be processed through water gas shift reaction to produce more hydrogen. The second method is electrolytic process. It is the separation of water into hydrogen and oxygen, which can be done in an electrolyzer. Third one is solar-driven processes, which use light as medium for hydrogen production. Primary examples are photobiological, photoelectrochemical, and solar thermochemical processes. Photobiological uses the natural photosynthetic activity of bacteria and green algae. Photoelectrochemical uses semiconductors to separate water into oxygen and hydrogen. Thermochemical uses concentrated solar power to process water splitting reactions. The last method is the biological processes which use bacteria and microalgae to break down organic matter such as biomass or wastewater to produce hydrogen directly. One example of this is fermentation using certain bacteria to produce hydrogen. 
Here are some advantages and disadvantages in the use of hydrogen fuel. First, it is considered to be renewable because of the abundant supply. Considering that hydrogen can be found in many compounds such as hydrocarbon, it is a clean energy source and non-toxic to human health. Hydrogen fuel also have high efficiency which will be discussed and compared with fossil fuel power plant in process description and chemical processes. Production of hydrogen fuel is known to be expensive due to extraction processes such as electrolysis and steam reforming. Storage of hydrogen is complicated because of its nature. It has low density and needs to be compressed to liquid state. It also needs to be stored at low temperature. It is flammable and unsafe since it is odorless, which makes leakage detection difficult. Transportation is also an issue since it needs to be stored at high pressure and current storage tank designs are very limited, so transporting large amount of hydrogen is not yet possible. Last disadvantage is the fossil fuel-centric economy, wherein other sectors of industry depend on fossil fuel for their energy. It will be difficult and almost impossible to suddenly change a system that is currently working despite some concerns. There are other methods of power generation. In this report, I will discuss six more. Hydro, solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, and nuclear. These are all renewable sources of energy except nuclear. And we will tackle each of them further. First is hydroelectric power. What happens in hydroelectric power is energy is produced by taking advantage of flowing water from dams and rivers. So yung water nag flow siya from above, papunta sa baba. Then yung stream niya, yun yung nagpo-produce ng electricity. So how? Water. The flow of water is responsible for the turbines to produce mechanical energy. So turbines are installed somewhere in the stream. And the stream pushes the turbine and produce mechanical energy. It is then converted into electricity via generator. So yung pinoproduce na mechanical energy ng turbine, napapasa siya sa generator, and then yung generator, Bah-ha. siya nang bahala na mag-convert ng mechanical energy into electricity. It is then usable for consumption. Second one is solar panels. Photons from the sun is absorbed by the panels composed of P-silicon and N-silicon displacing an electron from silicon and leaving a space for an electron. So yung sun rays, composed siya ng photons or small particles. Yung photons na yun, once na tumama siya sa solar panel, nadidisplace niya yung isang electron from a silicon element. Then yung electron na yun, it's free to move. Tapos yung, di ba nadisplace siya, so magkakaroon ng hole dun sa panel kung saan nakalagay yung dating electron. Then, the electric field at the PN junction, which is yung nasa gitna ni N-silicon and P-silicon, makes the displaced electrons move towards the N-silicon and the hole towards the P-silicon. So, yung hole, dahil may electric field sa PN junction, yung hole, napupunta siya sa P-silicon, which is at the southern part of the panel. And yung electron, nandun siya sa northern part of the panel, which is the N-silicon. It is then connected to a circuit which makes the displaced electrons flow, generating electricity. It serves like a battery kasi nagkakaroon ka ng positive and negative um, poles somewhere in the panel. So yung electrons na nasa end silicon, nakakonect siya sa isang circuit and doon pwede mong maharness yung electricity. So since nasa circuit siya, the used electrons are taken to the P silicon where the electrons go back to its holes. So kapag nagamit na yung electricity na yun, yung mga electrons na ginamit, babalik siya sa P-silicon kasi nga nasa circuit lang siya. So kapag bumalik na siya sa P-silicon, babalik na siya dun sa hole kung saan talaga siya nanggaling. And then, it is a continuous process. Wind power. Giant rotor blades are used in order to generate electricity. Instead of turbines, giant rotor blades yung ginagamit dito. Then the flow of wind makes these blades turn, generating mechanical energy. So, pag nagtaturn na yung giant rotor blades, doon na siya nakaka-create ng mechanical energy because it's already moving. This then converted into electricity via generator. Same lang din dun sa kanina, dun sa hydroelectric power. Next is geothermal power. Heat from the Earth's internal energy makes the water heat into steam. Then kapag naging steam na yung water, the flow of steam is responsible for the turbines to turn. 
generating mechanical energy. So may naka-install din na turbine somewhere dun sa flow of stream. Tapos, nag-generate na siya ng mechanical energy once na nag-turn na yung turbine. It is then converted into electricity via generator. Next is biomass. It is similar to the generation of electricity by coal. However, the source of energy is plant waste, which absorb energy from the sun via photosynthesis. So dito naman, instead na coal yung binaburn, plant waste yung binaburn, which is meron din siyang stored na chemical energy from the sun. Kasi nag-undergo ng photosynthesis yung mga plants. These plant waste are burned to convert water into steam, which generates mechanical energy via turbines. Pag binur na nga yun, yung heat mula dun sa combustion process, um, siya yung nag-turn ng water into steam. Then same as sa kanina, yung flow of steam, siya yung nagpapaikot sa turbines. It is then converted into electricity via generator. So yung purpose ng generator, nag-convert lang siya ng mechanical energy into electricity. Then, nuclear power. Radioactive elements. Usually, uranium-235 undergo nuclear fission when bombarded with neutrons. So, yung radioactive elements, um, nag interact siya with neutrons, which is an, an uncharged particle. So, kapag nag, nag interact siya sa neutrons, mag, mag-split up yung radioactive element. Ang tawag doon, nuclear fission. It is an exothermic process. So, the exothermic process releases radiation in the form of heat which converts water into steam. So dahil dun sa process na yun, nagkakaroon ng heat. Tapos yung heat na yun, yun yung mag-turn ng water into steam. The steam is responsible for the turbines to spin, causing mechanical energy. It is then converted into electricity via generator. So usually sa mga, sa mga other forms of power um, generation, same lang siya as coal, um, turbines, tapos generators. For the process description and chemical processes involving electricity generation for fossil fuel based energy generation industry, the process flow diagram that is shown is based from a coal based power plant. Na kung saan, maraming variations ang coal based power plant. Yung nakikita nyo dito sa process flow diagram ay isang open cycle steam. Na kung saan, yung ginagamit na hangin sa combustion ng coal ay mula sa atmosphere. Tapos yung nagpapagana sa turbine para pagana yung generator na nagpo-produce ng electricity ay isang supercritical na steam. Ang ibig sabihin ng supercritical na steam ay, ay steam na kung saan yung temperature niya at pressure niya ay lagpas sa, super, sa critical points nila. Para hindi kayo malito sa process flow diagram or kung saan dumada, kung ano yung mga materials na nagpo-flow sa bawat process sa processes at unit at unit operations yung mga arrows dito ay nasa iba't ibang kulay yung legend nakaano sa upper right corner na kung saan yung brown ay superheated steam yung blue yung water tapos yung yellow ay yung flue gas na galing sa coal tapos yung violet is yung air na ginagamit sa combustion tapos yung gray naman is yung ash na byproduct ng combustion tapos yung black naman ay yung coal mismo. Yung process flow diagram ng coal-based power plant ay nakamodel din based sa Rankine cycle na kung saan yung energy conversion from heat to work, yung water na convert siya into supercritical steam na kung saan yung supercritical steam ay ginagamit sa pag-ikot ng turbine. Tapos yung outlet ng supercritical steam na naging steam ay nakokondense ulit sa water. Tapos pinapump niya ito ulit sa boiler para ma-recycle ulit. Tapos ulit-ulit lang yung process. Ito yung summary ng energy production from coal. Una, yung combustion na kung saan yung potential or yung chemical energy na na-store sa coal ay nakoconvert into heat energy. And then next is yung boiling. Yung heat energy na nang galing mula sa combustion ay ginagamit para mo-convert yung water into supercritical steam na kung saan ito yung ginagamit sa turbine rotation na pinapaikot nito na yung steam mismo ginag- na, na na-convert ay ginagamit na pang paikot sa mga turbines na kung saan yung heat energy ay nako-convert into mechanical energy tapos yung rotational motion na galing sa turbine ang ginagawa ng step up transformer ay pinapataas yung voltage ng electricity na napoproduce Kapag nakapag-travel na to sa mga 
sa mga communities, una, pumupunta muna siya sa mga local power stations na kung saan ini-step down muna niya yung voltage ng, ele- ng electricity na dumadaan doon. Yung pag-step down, ibig sabihin, binabawasan niya yung voltage ng electricity. Tapos, pagkatapos naman nito, it is further being stepped down by the ano, by the transformers that na nakikita nyo do sa mga poste for power generation from fossil fuel specifically coal yung unang proseso na ginagawa ay yung fuel preparation na kung saan yung coal ay pinupulverize muna sa coal handling plant with a standard fineness of 200 to 325 mesh which is equivalent to a talcum powder ang purpose ng pagpulverize ng Coal I first is to increase its surface area para mas mabilis yung rate of reaction. Ibig sabihin nito, mas madali siya makumbas. The second naman is to ensure that the coal is completely comb- is completely combusted. Ang equipment naman na ginagamit sa coal handling plant para mas separate yung coal sa ibang impurities ay una ay yung metal detector at yung magnetic separator. Yung metal detector, it detects the presence of ferrous and non-ferrous metal in the coal. It consists of a transmitter and a receiver to relay a signal to the movement of the conveyor belt. At saka, yung magnetic separator, this removes ferrous impurities or yung mga metals mismo. Sa coal handling plant, may it consists of several processes. First, yung collection hopper, dito pumupunta yung mga coals na galing sa ma- sa mga mines. Then, it is, this coal is separated from other impurities such as metal through the use of the metal detector and the magnetic separator. And then, the coal is then pul- pulverized in the breaker or in the mill. Either na yung pulverized coal ay napupunta sa coal pile or dumediretso sa, sa isang separator na kung saan it further separates the coal based on its weight and its, an, its specific gravity. And then, yung mga coals na na-separate ay pumupunta sa respective coal silo ng plant na either na magagamit siya sa... na either na yung coal mismo ay pupunta siya direkta sa, sa boiler or mamimaintain mo na siya dyan sa coal silo na yan. Isang byproduct ng combustion ay yung ash. Yung bottom ash na nagsasettle down sa baba ng furnace ay pumupunta sa ash handling plant. Ang purpose nito is to prevent accumulation of non-combustible material. Kapag nasobrahan naman sa accumulation nitong mga ash, pwede ito makadamage ng mga unit operations at unit processes. Kinakailangan ito ng frequent maintenance kapag inefficient yung ash handling plant. E, yung mga ash dito, pwede itong dalhin sa mga ibang industries katulad ng cement kasi yung ash na napoproduce ng coal, pwede siya magamit na raw material for cement production and road production. Yung mine coal, kapag nag-undergo siya sa coal handling plant, magiging, magiging pulverized coal siya na may high purity. Itong pulverized coal na to ay papasok sa furnace kasama ng isang oxidizing fuel which is air na mag undergo sa combustion. Ang combustion is that a process na kung saan yung potential or yung chemical energy ng coal ay convert into heat energy. Ito yung nangyayari sa furnace. Yung coal powder is mixed with hot air. And then, coal and air mixture is burned in the furnace of the boiler. Then, hot gas travel all around the vo- boiler. Ang dahilan kung bakit yung coal powder ay hinalo sa hot air is that yung purpose ng air dito is to, dis- to make the coal particles to be more dispersed para mas maano nila yung para mas maging more in contact sila sa heat na napoproduce sa, ng furnace. Yung heat na napoproduce ng furnace is usually at 2480 degrees Celsius. Ito yung mga main reactions na nangyayari sa furnace. Una, yung combustion ng carbon into carbon dioxide or in some cases nagiging carbon monoxide siya dahil sa incomplete combustion. Pero Itong carbon monoxide, pwede siya maging carbon dioxide kapag nag-react sa oxygen gas. Tapos, yung sulfur naman sa, sa coal, nagiging sulfur dioxide siya dahil sobrang taas ng temperature ng furnace. Kaya kaya nyo itong gawin. Ganun din sa nitrogen gas, kaya, which is converted into nitrogen monoxide. 
And then furthermore, this nitrogen monoxide is converted to nitrogen dioxide through further conversion. Pero usually, ang ratio ng nitrogen monoxide to nitrogen dioxide is that mas mataas ang percentage ng nitrogen monoxide compared sa nitrogen dioxide na byproducts. Aside dito sa mga main reactions, ang nagiging product din ng combustion ng coal is yung production ng mga ashes which can be separated into two. The fly ash which is yung yung ash na nadadala ng hangin at saka yung bottom ash which is which are yung ash na nagsasettle sa baba. Ito naman yung mga factors that affect, affects the output. Una, yung purity ng coal. At saka pangalawa, yung calorific value ng coal. Pag sinabing calorific value, ito yung heat, yung energy na naikastor na na, na, na na sa coal. Itong combustion process, nag-start siya at nag-end siya sa boiler. Ang reason nito is that yung furnace mismo, isa, isa lang siyang part ng ano ng boiler. Ang boiler kasi isa siyang malaking process unit process or unit operation na nagko-consist ng maraming unit processes at unit operations. Sa loob ng boiler, pagkatapos ng combustion ng coal sa loob ng furnace, yung heat na na-release sa combustion ay ginagamit sa pag-convert ng water into supercritical steam sa process na boiling. Boiling, this is where purified water is pumped through tubes of the boiler. This converts water into supercritical steams which generate the maximum heat. Yung temperature niya ay umaabot sa 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit or approximately 537 degrees Celsius. At saka yung pressure din umaabot ng 3,500 pounds per square inch or approximately 238 atmosphere. Since yung temperature sa boiler ay umi-increase at saka yung volume niya constant kasi nga naka-enclose siya. Kaya ganyan yung nangyayari, sobrang taas. And then, the high pressure and superheated steam na lumabas sa boiler ay mapupunta sa turbine for, air, for conversion of heat energy to mechanical energy. Yung start process ng boiler, boiling, ay simula, magsisimula sa boiler, tapos mag-e-end siya sa boiler pa rin. Sa loob ng boiler, yung flue gas at saka yung fly ash na naproduce sa furnace ay dadaan muna sa tatlong heat exchangers bago ito lumabas sa chimney or sa flue. Dadaan muna to sa superheater, sunod sa economizer, at saka sa huli, na, pahuli naman ay air preheater. Ang purpose nito ay para ma-recycle yung heat ng flue gas at saka ng fly ash na kung saan itong heat na itong na-recycle ay gagamitin sa pag-increase ng temperature ng tubig na gagawing supercritical steam at saka sa pag-init din ng air na gagamitin sa combustion ng coal. Yung pathway naman ng water na gagawing into supercritical steam ay magsisimula sa economizer na kung saan yung economizer mismo nag increase ng temperature ng highly pressurized water from the feed water pump na kung saan inaabsorb niya yung heat energy na mula sa flue gas at sa fly ash. Pagkatapos naman, pumu pagkatapos naman, yung tubig na galing sa economizer ay dadaloy sa steam drum. Tapos pupunta siya sa down camber na nakakonekta sa water wall. Dito sa water wall na to, dito nangyayari yung phase change ng from water to steam. Pero hindi siya talaga purely steam kasi may mga water droplets pa siya. Kaya ang gagawin dito is Babalik siya ulit sa steam drum. Dito, magkakaroon ng separation ng water droplets at saka steam. Kaya ang lalabas sa steam drum ay pure steam. Pero may moisture content pa rin siya. Kaya, ang gagawin dito, yung saturated steam ay pupunta sa superheater na kung saan it converts saturated or wet steam to superheated or dry steam in which the temperature of the superheated steam is approximately 550 degrees Celsius. Pagkatapos nun, lalabas sa superheater ay isang supercritical na steam na pupunta sa turbine. Related sa superheated steam na lumalabas sa boiler, ang pressure nito ay approximately 167.77 atmosphere. Ang reason kung bakit supercritical steam ang ginagamit sa pagpaikot ng turbine sa electricity generation is that 
From the second law of thermodynamics, the higher the temperature of the heat source, the more efficient the cycle will be. Ang ibig sabihin nito, kapag mas mataas yung temperature ng steam, mas magiging efficient yung power plant sa pag-generate ng electricity. This law of thermodynamics is supported by a particular theorem which is the Carnot's theorem wherein the maximum thermal efficiency coefficient of a power plant is equal to 1 minus the ratio of the heat that is coming in of the process at temperature Tc divided by the max the heat that is coming out of the process at temperature Th. Pero ang problema dito may maximum allowable heat, heat limit allowable limit lang ibig sabihin nito hindi pwede maging 100% thermal efficient yung power plant ang dahilan nito is that may limit may parang maximum limit na temperature lang na kayang i-withstand ang turbines ganun din yung mga pipes na nakoconnect sa turbine pagkatapos ng boiling yung supercritical steam ay dadaan sa turbine rotation process na kung saan yung heat energy na galing sa supercritical steam ay mako-convert into mechanical energy via rotation wherein the steam is conveyed into a, into the turbine the temperature of the superheated steam decreases from 550 degrees celsius to, to 353 degrees celsius high pressure of the steam pushes the blade of the turbine the turbines turn like a fan and cause the shaft to rotate tapos in relation to this, there are conditions affecting the efficiency of the power plant regarding to the turbine. First, the maximum bearable temperature of the turbine blades is 600 degrees Celsius, approximately. Where typical material in turbine blades cannot withstand very high temperature. Dahil dito, yung efficiency ng buong power plant ay hindi talaga nakaka-meet ng 100%, 100%. Yung mechanical energy galing sa turbine rotation ay napupunta sa generator through power generation na kung saan itong mechanical energy nito ay nakoconvert into electrical energy. Sa power generation, the turbine shaft spins the generator magnets. Then, the magnets are driven inside the wire coils which produces an induced current. Then, at, sa, at the same speed as the turbine blades, the rotation produces an electromagnetic field from the induced current, which results to the mechanical energy being converted into electrical energy, in which this electrical energy is distributed to the power grid. In power generation, there are factors that affect the final electrical output. First, the energy loss due to surroundings through the interconversion of energy into different forms. Examples of this are energy losses in the combustor, energy losses in the turbine, and energy losses in the steam generator. Another factor affecting final electrical output of the power plant is that the energy loss from the heat contained in the combustion byproducts that was not utilized by the power plant such as bottom ash. Maliban sa electricity generation proper ng coal-based power plant, meron din tong water cycle na kung saan yung steam na ginamit sa pag-ikot ng turbine ay kinocondense tapos binabalik ito ulit sa boiler para maging super critical steam. Sa so water cycle, nagsisimula yung proseso sa mga water reservoir na kung saan dito pinag kukuna ng tubig na ginagawang supercritical steam for electricity generation. Maliban dito, yung mga water reservoir nagsisilbi din siyang pang supply ng mga tubig just in case na magkaroon ng mga water losses sa power plant. Pero bago pumunta yung tubig sa boiler, kailangan niya muna pumunta sa water handling plant na kung saan tinatanggal niya yung mga impurities na, na nakahalo sa tubig. Pagkatapos naman, yung tubig na may high purity, pumapasok naman sa feed water pump para, i para taas tataasin yung pressure niya. Pagkatapos, yung pressurized water ay pumapasok sa water heater where it is used to preheat the water before entering the economizer. And it also allows to gradually increase saturation temperature. Ang purpose ng preheating ng tubig is to minimize any irreversibilities with the heat transfer of water. Sa water cycle, maliban sa mga water reservoir na pinagkukunan ng tubig ng planta, 
pwede rin i-recycle yung steam na lumalabas sa turbine para magamit ulit ng planta. Yung steam na lumalabas sa turbine ay pumapasok sa condenser na kung saan it condenses the exhaust steam from the turbine to reuse the water in the cycle. Pagkatapos naman, yung condensed steam pumapasok sa condensed extraction pump. Yung lumalabas dito, yung lumalabas na tubig ay nagmo-merge sa tubig na nanggaling sa water handling plant, plant na papunta sa feed water plant pump. Then, yung tubig na ginamit sa condenser ay pumapasok sa cooling tower na kung saan it extracts waste heat from the hot water and cools it to a lower temperature. Cooling the water is needed to maintain proper heat exchange and prevent water source becoming too warm. Ang dahilan nito is to pre ang dahilan nitong prevention of water becoming too warm is that water mass source is usually situated in river which causes environmental problems in the aquatic system such as death of fishes and other water living organisms. Yung cold water na galing sa cooling tower ay nagmo-merge dun sa water na kinuha galing sa mga water reservoir just in case na may mga water losses galing sa cooling tower na papunta sa circulating water pump. Pagkatapos, yung water na pumapasok sa circulating pump, pinupush niya yung tubig papunta dun sa condenser. Yung tubig na lumalabas sa circulating water pump, ay pumupasok sa condenser na kung saan ito naman ay ginagamit ulit sa pag-cool down ng steam na galing sa turbine and the cycle repeats. Yung possible modification na pwedeng ilagay sa cold base power plant ay yung paglalagay ng scrubber bago sa chimney or sa flue. Ang ginagawa ng scrubber ay tinatanggal niya yung fumes na galing sa flue gas na toxic katulad ng nitrogen oxides or yung NOx at saka yung sulfur dioxide. Sa proseso naman ng scrubber na pagtanggal ng mga nitrogen oxide or yung NOx, linalagyan to ng hydrogen peroxide at saka nitric acid. Yung hydrogen peroxide may 0.5 to 1% weight siya. Tapos sa nitric acid naman may 35 to 45% weight to form nitric acid at saka nitrous oxide. Then, elimination of nitrous oxide na kung saan ito nagre-react -re sa nitric acid at saka sa water vapor para mag-produce ng nitrous acid. And then, yung nitrous oxide conversion to nitric acid conversion, nangyayari ito kapag yung nitrous acid, nitrous acid ay nagre-react sa, nagre sa hydrogen peroxide para mag-form ng nitric acid at sa water vapor. Yung nitric acid na napo-form dito is useful para sa production ng ammonium nitrate na ginagamit sa fertilizer at saka sa manufacturing and production of plastics and dyes. Sa scrubber naman na nagtatanggal ng mga sulfur dioxide, ginagamitan to ng limestone scrubbing na kung saan spray mixture of limestone and water to react with sulfur dioxide. Yan ito yung main reaction. Calcium carbonate plus sulfur dioxide plus oxygen gas yields to calcium sulfate plus sulfur dioxide. Ito, continuous process lang to hagang mawala yung sulfur dioxide na product since in excess naman yung limestone tapos yung oxygen gas. Yung calcium sulfate dito or yung synthetic gypsum ay pwedeng magamit sa manufacturing ng cement at saka wallboard. Pwede rin ito magamit sa soil added amendment in agriculture and construction. This is the hydrogen fuel process flow diagram. Hydrogen and oxygen are supplied inside the fuel cell stack via a hydrogen pressure vessel and air. So, the reaction inside the fuel cell stack generates electricity and its waste product is water, which goes to the water tank. The electricity being generated is transferred to the battery, to a DC motor, or to an inverter, which then leads to the AC motor. So let's discuss this diagram further. This is what happens inside the process. So from hydrogen atoms to energy. First is oxidation, where hydrogen atoms are split into two protons and two electrons. This is the oxidation half reaction. The electrons then flow from the anode to the cathode by circuit. Electricity consumption is through AC and DC motors, or in this case, it can also be 
through a battery. After the flow of electrons from anode to cathode via circuit, the reduction half reaction occurs in the cathode, where half a mole of oxygen atom plus two protons and two electrons generate into water, which is the waste product. Let's, let's discuss this reaction further. Power generation from hydrogen fuel. The first step happens inside the anode, where hydrogen is fed into the anode section of the cell. The catalyst present in the anode side of the cell splits the hydrogen into two protons and a pair of electrons, making a half reaction. Next is the proton exchange membrane. From the name itself, proton exchange membrane, the PEM between the anode and the cathode of the cell allows protons to travel through the catalyst of the cat cathode. So yung protons na product mula sa half reaction ng anode, nagta-travel siya dun sa proton exchange membrane papunta dun sa catalyst ng cathode. Well, yung electrons, hindi siya nakapass through sa proton exchange membrane. Electricity generation. The electrons, which is the product from the uh, oxidation half reaction inside the anode, travel through an electrical circuit, DC motor or inverter for AC, or a battery. This generates electrical current. The electrons flow from the anode to the cathode catalyst. So, yung flow na yun, nasa circuit siya, so pwede mong i-harness yung electricity doon. Then, once these electrons are used up, they travel to the cathode. So, inside the cathode, oxygen is fed into the cathode section of the cell. Oxygen reacts with the two protons, galing dun sa proton exchange membrane, which is galing dun sa anode, so, and the two electrons from the circuit, resulting in water. This is the half reaction of oxygen. So, the half reaction inside the cathode is half a mole of diatomic oxygen plus two protons plus two electrons result into water, which is the waste product. Gener if these two half reactions are combined, the two reactions from a general reaction of diatomic hydrogen plus half a mole of diatomic oxygen resulting into water plus heat. So it is an exothermic process, enthalpy. The heat of the reaction is calculated by enthalpy, or delta H. Enthalpy of reaction is the enthalpy of formation of products minus the enthalpy of formation of reactants. So yung enthalpy, yun yung total na heat ng reaction. So assuming the system is in atmospheric pressure and temperature, the enthalpy values can be looked up on the thermodynamic enthalpy table. So merong enthalpy table which is andun lahat ng values for enthalpy at standard conditions. So this is the formula for the enthalpy or of reaction. Delta H is equal to the H sub F of water, which is the product, minus the reactant. So the H sub F, or the enthalpy of hydrogen, which is a reactant, minus the half, half a mole of enthalpy of oxygen, which is also a reactant. Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy, or delta G, is the available output energy and has a formula of delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So basically, delta H, yun yung total na heat ng system. Whereas delta G, yun lang yung heat na pwede mong makuha. Or yun yung available output energy. Yeah. Entropy, on the other hand, entropy or delta S, is the energy that is unavailable for doing useful work due to the disorder in the system. So dahil nagkaroon siya ng reaction, nagkaroon siya ng disorder, Yung entropy, yun yung heat na hindi na kayang i-consume pa. Kasi yun yung heat na kailangan para mag-proceed yung reaction. So entropy of reaction is equal to the entropy of formation of product minus the entropy of formation of reactants. Same lang din yung formula niya, same lang din yung formula niya dun sa enthalpy. So assuming the system in atmospheric pressure and temperature, the entropy values can be looked up on the thermodynamic entropy table. So just like in enthalpy, meron din tayong table for for entropy. The formula for the entropy of reaction is delta S is equal to S sub F of water, which is a product, minus the S sub F of hydrogen, which is a reactant, minus half the S sub F of oxygen, which is also a reactant. The theoretical efficiency of the cell can be calculated as the ratio of the Gibbs free energy and the enthalpy. So kailangan lang natin yung entropy dito 
para makuha natin yung Gibbs free energy. This is a working example of the efficiency of the cell. Yung reaction, hydrogen plus half a mole of oxygen resulting into water plus heat at atmospheric temperature and pressure. So dito, given din tayo nung nasa table ng values ng enthalpy and entropy. So first, calculate natin yung enthalpy. Delta H is equal to H sub F of H2O, which is the product minus the sum of the reactants, H sub F of hydrogen plus H sub F of half of oxygen. So let's just plug in the, the values from the table to the formula. So negative 286.02 kilojoule per mole minus 0 kilojoule per mole plus 0 kilojoule per mole. It results into negative 286.02 kilojoule per mole. So yun yung enthalpy value niya nung reaction. Oh. Same lang din sa entropy. Same lang din yung formula. So, sa entropy, delta S is equal to S sub F of water minus the sum of the reactants, S sub F of hydrogen plus S sub F of half of oxygen. So, equal to 0 0.06996, which is nasa table, kilojoule per mole per Kelvin. Minus 0 0.13066 kilojoule per mole per Kelvin plus half ng 0 0.20517 kilojoule per mole per Kelvin. Pag tinipe niyan sa calculator, ang resulting niya, negative 0 0.163285 kilojoule per mole per Kelvin. So, yun yung entropy ng system. Next is the Gibbs free energy. So, since alam na natin yung value for entropy and enthalpy, we can calculate Gibbs free energy, wherein delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, where T is the temperature at absolute. So, negative 286.02 kilojoule per mole, which is the enthalpy, minus 25 degrees Celsius ang standard. So, convert it into Kelvin, 298 Kelvin. Multiplied to negative 0 0.163285 kilojoule per mole per Kelvin, which is the entropy. So, pag kinalculate natin siya, ang resulting niya is 237.36 kilojoule per mole. So, yun na lang yung energy available. So, makakalculate natin yung theoretical e cell efficiency delta G over delta H. So, ipa-plug in lang natin yung values. 237.36 kilojoule per mole over 286.02 kilojoule per mole. That gives us 0.8299 or 82.99%. So, 82.99% so, efficient yung cell natin if theoretical. Other hydrogen fuel cell system, steam reformer. So, ito yung mga ways kung paano tayo makakukuha ng hydrogen. So, first is from reforming methanol or CH3OH. Methanol and water are vaporized and passed through a heated chamber with a catalyst. So, yung methanol and water, vinevaporized siya para makakuha ka ng Hydrogen. So, ang primary reaction niya, methanol results into carbon monoxide and two hydrogen atoms. So, yung reaction na yun, it takes place in high pressure and 800 degrees Celsius temperature. It is a highly endothermic process. So, um, it is not spontaneous. So, we need to apply energy. Then, water gas shift reaction. This is the secondary reaction. Produced carbon monoxide in the primary reaction is combined with the oxygen in water. So, yung reaction niya, water plus carbon monoxide results into carbon dioxide plus hydrogen. So, yung carbon monoxide na nasa primary reaction, nire-react siya with water. So, yung overall methanol reforming reaction is methanol plus water results into carbon dioxide plus 3 moles of hydrogen. So, that's how you... Um, get hydrogen from methanol. Next one is reforming natural gas or methane. So, methane reacts with water vapor to form hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide. So the primary reaction for this reformation is methane plus water results into carbon monoxide plus 3 moles of hydrogen. So the secondary reaction which is also a water gas shift reaction Produced carbon monoxide in the primary reaction is combined with the oxygen in water. So, same lang dun sa kanina. Water plus carbon monoxide results into carbon dioxide plus hydrogen. 
So the overall methane reformation reaction is methane plus 2 moles of water results into carbon dioxide plus 4 moles of hydrogen. So kung mapapansin nyo, mas marami siyang hard So kung mapapansin nyo, mas marami siyang hydrogen na napoproduce kaysa sa i-reform mo yung methanol. The thermodynamic efficiency of this reaction is 70 to 85 percent. And the primary factor affecting the efficiency is the purity of the hydrogen product. So as this as this uh, process or as this reaction go along, we cannot um, we cannot assume that hydrogen is pure after. So this is a significant comparison between hydrogen fuel and fossil fuel. First is hydrogen fuel has a higher efficiency than fossil fuel. So in a hydrogen fuel cell, chemical energy is converted into electrical energy, uh, which is approximately 80% which is yung kinalculate nga natin kanina, 80% nga, at standard conditions. Uh, next is steam turbine generator, which is primary, primary process siya sa fossil fuel. So, chemical energy into heat, into mechanical energy, into electrical energy, which is approximately 37%. Bakit? Kasi mas marami siyang processes na dinadaanan. So, mas maraming heat na nakoconsume nung process. So, conversion of energy results to energy loss to surroundings. Yun nga, gaya nga rin nung sinabi ko, mas marami siyang dinadaanan. So, yung energy niya, pwede siyang malos, ma, pwede siyang malus somewhere sa process, papunta sa surroundings. So, second is the determinant for maximum efficiency. So, sa fuel cell, change gives free energy. So, sa gives free energy, pwede mong ma-determine yung maximum efficiency. Sa steam turbine generator naman, Carnot's theorem, which is represented by N max. So, yung N max na yun, it only applies to heat engines. So, hindi mo talaga siya, hindi talaga siya accurate and hindi siya pwedeng ma-apply sa lahat ng engines na gagamitin mo sa processes. Next is current challenges in the use of hydrogen fuel. First is, it is dependent on fossil fuel. Approximately 95% hydrogen used today is produced from natural gas through thermal process. A good example is steam reforming. So yung natural gas nga kanina tulad nung sa methane and sa methanol, they are used to harness hydrogen. So dependent siya sa fossil fuel. Next is reforming. Sa reforming, merong dalawa, A and B. A is contamination. Pollutants such as sulfur remain after reforming, which must be removed before using the hydrogen. So tulad nga nung sinabi ko kanina, hindi natin mag na pure yung hydrogen after nung process. So kailangan mo na siyang i-purge or i-remove. Next is temperature. Expensive material for the construction of reformer because of high temperature. Tulad nga nung diniscuss ko kanina, yung reaction takes place at high temperature, approximately 800 degrees Celsius. Three is hydrogen storage. Current storage are still being developed to a sustainable design due to the nature of hydrogen gas. Yung storage ng hydrogen gas, medyo hindi pa siya fully developed and kailangan pa ng more research and development para makastore tayo ng hydrogen gas in a safe way. Yung sa material at energy balances, ang ginawa namin dito ay dinugtong na namin yung dalawang types ng balances sa isang process flow diagram na kung saan ang batayan nito ay isang coal-based power plant na gumagamit ng open cycle steam turbine na may assumptions na all unit processes and operations are 100% thermal efficient except for the turbine and generator which are both 50% efficient. Then, coal undergoes complete combustion under 30% excess or approximately pure oxygen gas. Then, Molar mass of coal is approximated to be 1,931 grams per mole. No heat loss to the atmosphere during the transfer and conversion of heat released from combustion except when passing through the turbine and generator. Then, the assumption for the thermal efficiency is due to the second law of thermodynamics where 100% thermal efficiency is not possible even if the situation is ideal. Then, Transfer of internal heat energy from water is used to generate electricity is negligible. Ibig sabihin yung existing heat na meron sa tubig at saka sa mga 
processes ay negligible kasi ang kinoconsider dito sa energy balances ay yung heat lang na na-release ng combustion ng coal. Then, as is considered to be incombustible wherein fly ash to bottom ash ratio is 228 is to 275. Then, due to the high temperature of the furnace, sulfur and nitrogen can be completely combusted where the latter with nitrogen oxide to nitrogen dioxide gas ratio of 20 is to 1. Then, pressure is constant when the feed directly goes in and out of each unit process or operation. Then, coal is assumed to be by 2 minus with gross calorific value of 24.5 megajoules per kilogram. Then, since it is, it is a batch process, the amount of electricity generated is not mentioned since power is time dependent. However, work done by the turbine can be used as a hint to determine it by specific specifying a particular time, time frame. Kasi ang ginamit dito, namin dito ay isang batch process. Hindi siya time dependent. Dependent siya sa quantity ng coal na linagay. Then, number 12. The last number. Heat source used by boiler or heater is only from the combustion or heat of C of coal and no reheating or superheating occurring. Ah, uh, ibig sabihin po nito ay yung heat na meron sa ano na na mer na meron sa boiler or heater ay hindi siya kino-consider kasi nga katulad ng sinabi ko kanina, ang kino-consider lang sa energy balances yung heat na galing sa combustion ng coal. Ang mga pinagbatayan naman na reaction sa balances na ginawa namin ay Combustion ng carbon into carbon dioxide gas, nitrogen gas to nitrogen monoxide gas. And for the combustion of nitrogen monoxide gas to nitrogen dioxide gas. And sa sulfur naman, sulfur is assumed to be rhombic in crystalline structure which is combusted into sulfur dioxide gas. Then hydrogen gas is converted to water vapor. Tapos, kukunin mo yung bawat heat of combustion ng ng bawat reactions at 25 degrees Celsius. Ganun din, kukunin mo rin yung heat capacity din ng bawat reaction at constant pressure. Tapos, kukunin mo yung summation ng, ng heat of combustion at saka summation din ng heat capacity. Yung summation nila, gagamitin nito para makuha yung heat na nare-release at, ng combustion at 2480 degrees Celsius, which is yung temperature ng furnace. Ang ginamit na basis or yung given sa balances ay 1 times 10 raised to 7 grams na coal na may proximate analysis na moisture content na 24.69%, volatile matter or volatile combustible matter na 32.2%, ash content is 4.19% at fixed carbon na nakuha by difference na 38.92%. Ang kailangan namin dito sa balance ay yung elemental composition ng coal. Kaya ang ginawa namin dito ay gamit yung given approximate analysis at kinuha namin yung volatile matter analysis na, kung na nagkaroon naman kami ng isa pang basis na 100 grams ng approximate analysis ng coal para makuha yung ultimate anal analysis which is yung, yung elemental composition ng coal. Yung sa ultimate analysis na kuha namin dito ay yung carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, at sulfur content ng coal. etong lahat na to, uh, yung carbon, hydrogen, tapos yung nitrogen, sulfur, lahat sila combustible. Yung mga hindi combustible na material ay considered na ash. Yun yung nakalagay sa ultimate analysis. Mula sa mga assumptions sa binigay at saka iba pang information regarding sa balances, Ito yung mga nakuhang data. Una, yung material balance na ginamit para sa coal, which is 1 times 10 raised to 7 grams nito. Yung input is yung coal mismo at saka oxygen gas na ginamit sa combustion sa furnace, na may total na 34,063,839.02 grams. Mula sa combustion nito sa isang furnace na may temperature na 2,480 degrees Celsius, yung mga nakuhang products dito ay... Water vapor, carbon dioxide, oxygen gas, nitrogen monoxide gas, nitrogen dioxide gas, sulfur dioxide gas, fly ash, at saka bottom ash na may total output na 34,063,839.02.
para naman sa water, material balance sa water na ginamit sa electricity generation, yung input mismo is yung water in liquid form na may amount na 5,138.11263 na kung saan kinonvert ito into steam na may output na 5,138.11263 grams. At saka, mula dito sa combustion ng coal at saka sa water na ginamit sa pag-generate ng electricity, yung energy balance naman for electricity generation, una is yung input na galing sa heat na generate galing sa combustion, which is 6,607,921.414 kilojoules. Mula dito sa heat na na-generate, ang mga na-produce na, ang na-produce na heat na ginamit para sa electricity generation which is the work done by the turbine and generator is 3,303,960.707 kilojoules. Ito yung work na ginamit para ma-generate ng electricity. Tapos yung ex others na other heat na hindi nagamit ay napunta sa heat na outlet stream o yung heat na galing sa ano sa steam na pang na generate ng electricity tapos yung heat naman na na release mula sa turbine at generator na may kapag tinotal mo to ay 6,607,921.414 kilojoules now let's move to the power generation industry in the Philippines the three fossil based stations are coal-fired power station, natural gas-fired power station, and oil-fired power stations. The coal-fired power station covers 42.62% of electrical demand in 2013. As of March in the same year, there are 32 coal-fired power plants connected to the energy grid. The energy grid is an interconnected network for delivering electricity from producers to consumers. Here are some lists of coal power plants in the Philippines. Their power generation capacity makes it up to the electrical demand of the country. Here is an example of coal power station with its specifications. The Mariveles Coal Fired Power Plant has two identical 316 megawatt power blocks for a net capacity of 632 megawatts. It uses pulverized coal technology which consists of Harbin boilers carbon turbines, and generators. Next power station is the natural gas. Based from the energy data in 2013, 24.07% of the country's energy came from natural gas. As of March 2016, there are 13 natural gas stations connected to energy grid. 12 of these are in Luzon, while the other one is located in Visayas. As you can see in the list of natural gas power plants, most of them are combined cycle power plants. A combined cycle power plant uses gas and steam turbine. The waste heat from the gas turbine is connected to another steam turbine to generate more electricity. Here is an example and specifications of a natural gas combined power plant. The Ilihan combined cycle power plant has two power blocks of 600 megawatts with a net capacity of 1,200 megawatts. Each power block has two gas turbines that produces 200 megawatts which total to 400 megawatts in the gas turbines alone. The other one is a steam turbine that covers the remaining 200 megawatts which sums up to 600 megawatts in a power block. The main fuel used is natural gas which has a 56.18% efficiency with corresponding consumption rate. The backup fuel is distillate oil and has a 49.60% efficiency. The Ilihan power plant is also the first facility to use the switch hard system and reverse osmosis. The last kind of fossil fuel power plant is oil fired. It only covers 5.97% of the country's energy in 2013. Looking at the capacity of oil power plants, they have relatively low capacity compared to coal fired and natural gas fired. In addition, the oil here is commonly used in vehicles. Here is one example of oil fired power plant. The so-called thermal power plant was an oil-fired steam turbine plant formerly known as Gardner Senior Thermal Plant. It was commissioned in August 1, 1968 
upon the completion of Unit 1. Three units were later added to produce 850 megawatts. It was completely decommissioned in January 2002 because it exceeded the limitations of Clean Air Act. That's it for our report. Thank you for listening.